a positive pregnancy test. If you've ever had one of these, do you remember how you felt? Did you have feelings of joy, happiness, relief? Or did you have feelings of pure horror, dread, fear? Or did you feel ambivalent? Was it planned or not planned? My vision would be that every positive pregnancy test would be received with, yes, I planned that, and that's what I wanted. I come from a family of five kids. I have three older sisters and a younger brother. And I remember telling my mom, you did some pretty good family planning, because all of us are about 18 months apart. And my mom said, planning? <laughs> what planning? Your dad traveled a lot, he came home, I got pregnant. <laughs> my mom, at the time of her first pregnancy, was a biology teacher um, in high school in the Philippines. And when she first got pregnant, she decided, you know what, I think I'm going to put my career goals on the side and stay home and raise my daughter. And by the time my family immigrated from the Philippines to Hawaii in 1968, they had four kids under the age of six, and my mom was pregnant with her son. And my mom did the best she could with the resources she had. As, an I, as I unpack the memories of my childhood, it's, it's mixed. I have really good memories of my childhood, but also memories of tension, struggle, a lot of arguing. And my mom did a lot for us. And there were moments in my childhood that I felt she wasn't that happy, maybe resentful of the life she now found herself in. And when I think about all the stuff she did, I, I only have two kids, the cooking, the lunches she packed, the laundry, the driving, the doctor's appointments, the dentist appointments. My mom was a good seamstress. All the clothes she mended, all the clothes she made. At times, we looked like the Von Trapp family from The Sound of Music, because we had the same clothes from the same cloth. And I wonder, what if, along the way, a healthcare professional asked my mom, what do you want in your reproductive life? Do you want kids? How many do you want? How far apart do you want them? And if my mom had a choice, truly had a choice in her reproductive life, would she have chosen something different for herself? Would she have been happier? Would she have felt that she had a voice and a choice in the life she would have. And what if we asked all people who had the potential to reproduce those questions? And what if we asked that all the time and every time? I became a nurse midwife in 1998. I first practiced in New York City, and now I practice here in the Seattle area. So reproductive health is my specialty. It's my domain. And what we typically do is we ask patients as they come for their visits once a year about their family planning needs and birth control needs. And that approach simply isn't enough. It's not enough to ask people once a year about their reproductive goals. And we know that in the 30 or so years that women can reproduce, the majority of that time is spent not wanting pregnancy. And the data shows that girls are getting their first menstrual period much earlier than middle school, nine, 10 years old. So technically, those girls can get pregnant. And as a midwife, I've delivered a lot of people. The youngest person I delivered was 13. The oldest I delivered was 49. And in those extreme ages of childbearing, they did not want that pregnancy. We need to be asking 
at every point of contact in the healthcare system about reproductive goals. Because only if we do that will we start talking about it more and increase access to family planning services and birth control. In the United States, over six million pregnancies occur, and nearly half of those are unintended. Staggering. That means it was completely unwanted or mistimed. And of one of five of those unintended pregnancies are teenagers, right? And so that resonates with me, because I have a son and a daughter who are teenagers. But on the flip side of that, only 15% of childbearing age women who go through a provider, like a primary care provider, are asked about their reproductive goals. So think about 100 women going into the healthcare system for things like a headache, a cough, a sore throat, diabetes management, high blood pressure, asthma, medications, immunizations. Only 15 of those 100 women get asked if they need any birth control. When we talk about mistimed, that just means I want to have children or I want to have more children, but maybe not right now. Maybe I'm trying to finish high school, college, I'm trying to get healthier, I'm trying to lose weight, I'm trying to control my diabetes, I'm trying to get my blood pressure under control, I'm trying to quit smoking, I'm trying to quit drinking. Right? Every time we see someone who has the potential to reproduce, every time they walk into the healthcare system, I want to ask them, are you planning a pregnancy? Do you need birth control? Because that just opens up access. And until we can do that, we'll never empower people to take control of their reproductive lives. It cost our country, taxpayers, 12 to $15 billion a year to medically state fund unintended pregnancy. An unintended pregnancy leads to poor maternal and child health outcomes. So I went back to school not too long ago. I graduated in May with my doctorate in nursing practice. And my final project wanted to look at this because I was curious. Because it was shocking to me as a midwife, really, that one out of two women in the United States who got pregnant didn't want to get pregnant at that time. And why has that rate of nearly 50% been like that for three decades, despite education and awareness of birth control methods. So what I did was I did this deep dive into the most recent literature, and what I found was barriers. Access to birth control is blocked by barrier after barrier after barrier. Now, it could be a healthcare provider doesn't ask the questions, doesn't have time to ask the questions, doesn't have enough knowledge to ask the questions. Those are barriers. On the flip side of that, patients going into the healthcare system don't feel like they can ask for that because they're there for a cough or a sore throat. So what they do is they wait to their annual exam or they wait for a specialized appointment. And what I've seen a lot of is they just don't come back until they're pregnant. (laughs) And so when you look at that problem, when you look at the public health issue of that, you realize how big it is. And the barriers can be life, transportation, childcare, can't get out of work, privacy, coercion barrier after barrier after barrier, and meantime, the unintended pregnancy rate in the United States is nearly 50%. So I hate to dwell on the problem, so I like to look at solutions, right? So as I delved into the literature for solutions, the solutions are also quite massive. You have to really start looking at societal issues, health inequities, disparities in healthcare, economics, politics, 
education, insurance, and it becomes this really big public health issue that seems almost unsolvable, unmanageable, overwhelming. But what I did find was one simple solution that has the potential for a huge impact. Just ask. Ask women, ask men, ask anybody who can reproduce. All the time they come into the healthcare system, do you need birth control? Are you planning to get pregnant? So that it becomes this normal conversation it just becomes part of health questions. Like if someone asks you, are you smoking? Do you drink? What's your blood pressure like? It just becomes part of comprehensive health. As a midwife, I actually want to relinquish my specialty. I don't want it to be my specialty, family planning. I want it to be our collective responsibility to ask these questions all the time and every time. And as a mother of teens, I actually want their primary care provider, school nurse, urgent care staff, ER staff. Heck, I even want their orthodontist to ask them. Because you know, uh, my kids probably see their provider every 12 to 18 months, but I know they see their orthodontist every six weeks on the dot. And a visit would go something like this. How are your brackets today? What kind of color wires do you want? Do you floss every night? Are you planning to get pregnant in the next year? <laughs> I do, I want them to ask my kids that. And I've been in urgent care every six to nine months, right, for sports-related injuries. And I want that visit to look like this. How'd you break your thumb? What kind of medications are you on? Do you feel safe at home? Are you planning on getting pregnant in the next year? Just slip that in there. So back to my mom. The reality is that pregnancy decisions fall in that gray area. It's really hard to put pregnancy decisions in boxes of planned or unplanned. Because you may receive a positive pregnancy test and feel joyful and have a lifetime of regret. You may receive it and go, oh my god, and feel regret, but then end up with joy. You may receive it and not feel anything but then learn over time you have this resilience and love that you didn't know you had. And then sometimes you receive it and sort of privately decide, I can't go on with the pregnancy. A lot of different decisions come into that, but we gotta keep asking. Nobody ever asked my mom, I think, ever. And I wish I could have had that conversation much earlier before her dementia set in, simply to acknowledge that I now understood the struggle and how much she did for us and how hard that was. But here is what I do know. In order for true prevention of unintended pregnancies to occur, we need two things increase access and decrease barriers. And the only way you can do that or start to do that is by asking those crucial questions all the time and every time. Thank you.